Excellent. Uh, so we're going to get started with paper session number six. And uh, uh, our first speaker uh, is uh, yet again Carlos Palomini, and his paper is entitled From Baltic to Humboldt Room Compared Morphology and Symposium. Thank you. Thank you for your presence. I changed the name of the of the paper. Now it's a danceable shower of bullets. Sound morphologies and neurosis in the genesis of an EDM beat. Well, this paper, it's a development of something I published in 2014 in the Revista do Instituto de Estudos Brasileiros. It's a paper that's called the Age of Lula Tamborzão, Politics and Sonority, in which, well, this original paper from 2014, it's divided in two parts. First, I examine the public security policies during the government of Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. And then, in the second part, I analyzed two break bits, two no, three break bits of Frank Carioca, which correspond each more or less to one decade of this music. So in the 90s, we have mostly vote mix. In the first decade of the millennium, we have mostly tamborzão. And from 2010 onwards, a variety of beatboxes. For those who are not familiar with these break beats, it might be useful to hear them. Uh, here they are. That's the basic, basis, no. Base is the name in Portuguese, which I have translated for, I have translated as break beat, not beat because break beats have first beat, second beat. So to avoid confusion, I'm calling what we call base break beat. Uh, the vote mix comes from a track, a 1988 track of LA Electro called Eight Vote Mix. And it sounds like that. The bass is missing. Tamborzão. And beatbox. One of the beatboxes. So, uh, in short, uh, what I could verify is that there is a direct relationship between public security policies and sound morphology. In what way? Um, what happens in these three decades? In the 90s, the dances used to happen in clubs, which uh, existed in so-called neutral places. Why neutral places? Because they were not in the favelas. And in the favelas, because why aren't favela spaces neutral? Because in the 90s, favelas were already dominated by one or another of the illicit substance uh, factions. So they were either Comando Vermelho or Terceiro Comando. But the parties, the funk dances, happened mostly in clubs, which were viewed as neutral spaces, where people could come from no matter which uh, favela. During this period, these club events are closed. They are closed down by the government. 
under pretext that there were fights. And indeed, there were fights. They were recreational fights, ritualized fights, in which occasionally people died. So this served as a pretext to close down the clubs. When this happens in 99, the center of the dances moves to the favelas. So the first decade of the millennium is the decade in which the dances flourish in favelas. Um, by the end of this decade, in 2010, the terrible policy of pacifying police units and virtually ends with the bailes in favela. Favela dances are one by one closed down. I mean, there are still <coughs> favela dances, of course, but uh, what we do not have anymore is the big baile in the favela where music, the music would become successful, which would release the big hits. This does not happen anymore. So there are successive losses of space. First, the dances lose the asphalt, the tarmac. Then the dances lose um, the favela. And this passage, we may find as an, anal an anal analogy in sound morphology, because as one moves from volt mix to tamborzão, there is a loss in the upper region of the tessitura. In the break beat, I want to point out that I'm not talking about the musical production as a whole. I'm talking about one element of the musical production. That's the break beat. So between in the passage from the 90s to the new millennium, the beat loses elements in the upper region. In the passage from uh, the first decade of the new millennium to the years 2010, the beat loses, the break beat loses the lower, the lower region. Uh, when I wrote this, that's the the article of 2014. The reader said that there was an impoverishment in the music. No, losing the upper frequencies, losing the lower frequencies does not mean an impoverishment of the music. That's quite simplistic because, as I said, the break beat is one element. On the contrary, it means that the music opens itself up to hybridization, on which it depends in a moment in which it cannot happen in clubs, in clubs in the suburbs, in which it cannot happen in the bailes. So how is this music going to survive? And I think that the meaning, the actual meaning of this loss is to find, to become more combinable with other reference in, and in this way just to, to survive. So that's the old text from uh, 2014. What's the novelty in the new text? In this, in this text, I make a more detailed analysis of the passage from Volt mix to tamborzão, on these two, two bits, <coughs> from various perspectives. But my frame of reference is Pierre Schaeffer's typo morphology of sonic objects. I cannot explain everything here because typo morphology implies a vocabulary can, which is not a simple vocabulary. There's no time to explain the vocabulary. And after doing this analysis, this detailed analysis in 
terms of um, typo morphology, I do two other things. First, I see this transformation as an expression of Simon Blum's uh, con concrescence or concretization. And third, I seek to establish a connection between a social, not exactly social, so, psychosocial phenomenon, which is the, the rise of a character in the bias. This character is the neurotic. I don't know if you have heard this word in association with funky carioca. Um, indeed, you could, we could even consider it a subgenre of funk carioca. You probably, you may have heard of funk neurotic. Uh, the word neurosis appears in many, in some lyrics, for instance. Sem neurose, sem caô, muito amor no coração. Um, neurose is a term that appears associated with one character in 1998. And here I'm citing uh, an ethnography by Carla Matos. Uh, he, she's someone from Complexo da Maré, more precisely Nova Holanda, and she has studied the old dances, the five dances. <coughs> so, what can I say about analysis? Uh, I will start with representation. Um, first, traditional representation. Or more or less traditional representation in the full screen. That's a representation of the vote mix. It was done by one student of mine, Lucas Ferrari. Uh, what do we have here? We have, in the bot on the bottom line, we have kick drum. No, not kick drum, they call it bass drum. Ah, this sounds all come from the Roland TR-808. You have the bass drum. On the second line, we have snare drum. At the top, closed hi-hat. And in the, on the middle line, voltage oscillation. Voltage oscillation is not a sound, a proper TR-808 sound. The sound was obtained in the following manner. The 808, it have an uh, an output for controlling other pieces of equipment. And some people discovered that you could connect this trigger output to the recording desk, and that would produce a sound. That's the voltage, voltage sound. And that's why it's called volt mix, 808 volt mix. So what is representation does not show is one, the fact that these sounds are distributed in a very balanced manner in the field of pitch, what Schaeffer called the perceptual field of pitch, which we can call tessitura, simply. We have a very low sound, the bass drum. We have a sound in the medium, snare drum, or low medium. We have a, a very high sound, closed hi-hat. And we have one sound which, which links both extremes. That's the voltage oscillation sound. If you don't believe in me, I can show you the spectrogram, which is perhaps more convincing. View. 
So we have here on the left, snare drum, and it's very nice to see the second head resonating somewhat later with a grainy resonance. And you can see it occupies the entire medium register. At the top, you have the close hi-hat. At the bottom, bass drum. And here, the voltage oscillation. <coughs> Somewhat differently. Tamborzão moves down in the pitch of fields. In the field of pitch, sorry. <laughs> The pitch of fields now. In the field of pitch. Tools view. Mm -hmm. That's a representation of the tambor zone. One thing you can see. Well, well uh, the, this has been produced on another machine, a digital drum machine, the R8, R8 Mark II which is a drum machine from, from the early 90s, 10 years later. Uh, the, ba the kick drum, now it's kick drum, it basically repeats the volt mix line, just omitting the second, um, the second kick drum attack. In the middle, we have two tom-toms, upper tom-tom, lower tom-tom, at the top, two slap high congas. I mean, one slap high conga with two attacks and one open low conga. So there are displacement from the top. When I wrote that article in 2014, I, I imagined that there was nothing at the top. But then analyzing this breakbeat using the acousmograph, I could actually see something interesting, which I will show you here. So you may ask, how can I tell you that that thing there on the left is slap high conga? The second element is a tom tom, and this element is a kick drum. Well, we have had to isolate these lines one by one. We have bought an RA MK2. Mark II, and we have recreated these lines one by one, so as to make sure that we could get the proper representation, both in traditional notation and in this kind of uh, morphological representation. And one thing, one of the interesting things is that these lines, each of them isolated, they don't mean much. We have here the, bay, the kick drum line. You can't, I don't think you could identify the tambour zone exclusively exclusively through any of these lines middle line upper line They only start to make sense when you mix them. Here we we'll have combination of three two by two.
that kick drum and tom toms kick drum and congas and congas and tom toms So that's the tambour zone as we have recreated it on uh, an R8 drum machine. Uh, in which way, the, what does this have to do with concretization? I wrote a short sentence here because I wouldn't be able to think it now. The line of Tom Toms, the simplest and the less discernible one, takes on a triple function to keep up the pose as the hi-hat does in the volt mix, to amalgamate external lines as voltage oscillation does in the volt mix, to provide the beat with a dynamic profile which the volt mix lacks. The line of congas takes up the anacrustic function and the signature function of voltage oscillation. So this is, as I understand it, the manner in which this tamborzão, breakbeat, expresses Gilbert Simondon's notion of uh, uh, concretization. <coughs> well, I don't have any more time, although I should still talk about new roses, but you can read about it in the paper, which you can find in the preliminary proceedings. Sorry about it. Thank you very much. I can talk about new roses. <laughs> Do talk about new roses. Yes, with pleasure. I'm delighted to talk about new roses. Um, well, Tamborzão was created in 1998. And that's exactly the year when something which is a legend in the world of the fight dances happens. Well, I don't probably, perhaps many of you don't know what fight dances were. Fight dances were dances in which the space wide was divided into two. B side, A side, in the middle there was a corridor and facing each other, the most brave from side A and side B would fight each other uh, while security people would circulate in this space, sometimes with a uh, chain. <laughs> when they thought things were getting a little bit too heavy. So it was this was also called baile de baile de galera. So what is a galera? Galera is a group of bondes, a group of trains. The bondes were people from different one bonji or one train is a group of people from a certain community, from a certain morro, from a certain favela. 
bonds would get together from bonds from different places would get together to form the galeras uh, up to 1998 galeras could be composed by bonds from favelas that belonged to different factions i mean you could associate uh, the bonds could associate between themselves uh, independent of the faction that control the retail of illicit substance in their place of origin. In 1998, this changed because Comando Vermelho defines that Side B could only be composed by people who lived in favelas controlled by Comando Vermelho. And side A, people uh, who, come, who would come from favelas controlled by Terceiro Comando. So this was meant a huge change. It was not a welcome change because uh, association was discretionary. You could associate with whom, whomever you wanted. But then at this moment, a new human kind uh, starts to become dominant with a kind of solitary, lonely, and misadjusted guy who would find in the hierarchy of crime, a way of life, and would come to dominate with his personality the group, which up to that point had other kinds of value, more solidary values. Up from this moment on, 98, uh, it's the rise of new roses. We have so, time. New Roses is a collective feeling associated with the difficulty or the problems of circulating in territories that are dominated by different factions. That's what New Roses is. So we have time for a couple more questions. What else? <coughs> I would like to know if you know the origin of the um, the drum singing that they do nowadays, because uh, I heard that it was Mr. Catra, but uh, I'm not quite sure. Well, this is yeah. People say it's Mr. Catra. I've I've spoken to one of the um, one of the main DJs, which uh, who is. Grandmaster Rafael, he says it was Mr. Catra in the baile do Jacaré, in the favela do Jacaré. There is, I believe there is a consensus about that. I somewhat doubt it, because there is beatbox, which is this beat, and there is beatboxing, which is something much older than beatbox as a break beat. And I think beatboxing is present in funky carioca, has been present much long before this break beat. Uh, but probably Catra established a fashion, I think. O obviously, he didn't invent beatboxing, but generally people attribute it to him. He, he has not been able to put together a cohesive narrative that convinces anybody that he has invented it. But there is a certain consensus that Catra invented it. Uh, we have time for one more question. 
Yeah, I, I was curious about this neurosis associated with this change uh, in the kind of organization in yes. the crime scene. Uh, and if you have thought or have known about here in Sao Paulo, uh, it's a little later uh, the uh, uprising of PCC, the Primeiro Comando da Capital, that organizes crime in a different way, I think probably from 2004. Uh, and here it's exactly when funk becomes a, a, a phenomenon after Rio de Janeiro. Uh, so I'd like to know if, if, if this association between different crime organizations in different moments in Rio and in Sao Paulo, if, if you have... Well, uh, it's a little bit difficult to talk about this because there's something very striking. Uh, I study Prohibitão, as you know, which is the music which tells the problems and the pleasures of life in crime. And most singers of funk carioca, they have sing, they have sang, or they sing music associated with Comando Vermelho. All big singers have sung Comando Vermelho songs. Very, very few important singers have sung uh, Terceiro Comando. That's a kind of a mystery. I, I mean, I think I understand the reason. It's because Comando Vermelho was the first. Uh, all the others existed only by how do I say traição in English? Betrayal. So it's not something one can sing. Betrayal is not an allowed subject. <laughs> um, you cannot praise betrayal. There is, I mean, the, the birth of Frank Carioca, it happens it's concomitant with the spread of the cocaine trade in Brazil. So it's not the moment when the Comando Vermelho starts, but it's the moment when there is a radical shift in the behavior of the faction in which it becomes more violent by more violent, I mean more heavily armed. And there is already in this, there is a huge social, social, social change. It, the hill becomes much less picturesque and much more, much more dangerous. But I, I'm not able to establish a relationship with Sao Paulo because I don't know what happens in São Paulo. Thank you. Thanks mm -hmm. for your attention. Os dois são os mesmos. O som vai perceber.
not uh, okay boa tarde é, para mim isso é uma grande oportunidade é, é muito estranho para mim é, falar inglês aqui em São Paulo mas eu vou seguir o formato mas queria dizer que é, depois da sessão e tudo, eu gostaria de falar mais com vocês é, em português sobre este tema. Um, so, what I'm going to uh, talk about today is this question of what does it mean for a technologically amplified public voice to become so intimately associated with a particular place? And it strikes me that this mic is kind of perhaps appropriate considering my my topic and specifically what do the timbral specificities of spokes voices tell us about a given place um, and so this paper is specifically about two public figures in the small city of Arco Verde Pernambuco an emerging heritage tourism destination on the edge of the Sertão uh, of the interior uh, desert-like backlands of the Northeast. And the two figures are, Not. are uh, Lima Ferreira and José Pais de Lira Filho, both who are well-known enough in their hometown to be known just by their first names, Lima and Lira, right? And Lima recites death notices, funeral announcements, in a rich baritone voice from his truck mounted with speakers that roams the city. Uh, and when he does that, it sounds like this. Nota de falecimento. Maria Salete, Cíntia, Jonas Filho comunicam aos paredes e amigos o falecimento de Francisco Jonas Feitosa Costa Ocorrido hoje às 14 horas. And in contrast, uh, Lyra channels, uh, almost as if he's possessed, uh, legendary regional figures like the bandit Lampion and the millinery and priest Antonio Conselheiro. And the technological amplification of his ragged, distinctive voice is not through a sound truck, but through CDs and in person projected into microphones during live shows at uh, festivals and other gigs. So here are uh, a couple cinematic depictions of uh, the millinery and preacher Antonio Conselheiro and uh, Lampion, right, from the uh, film by Glauber Rocha. Deus e o Diabo na Terra do Sol, or uh, Black God, White Devil. And this is what Lyra sounds like. So what binds together Lima and Lyra is that each, I would argue, taps the power of the acousmetra or uh, the authoritative, intriguing, disembodied voice that is heard but not seen. And for this presentation, I, I'm going to engage with composer and film scholar, film sound scholar, Michel Chion's theorization of the acousmetra uh, and what i want to do is to i'm still figuring this out this is new territory for me i'm testing the extent to which the term can be applied outside of film in an ethnographic context to productively speak about the sonority of these extraordinary voices and i say extraordinary because following Chion, this kind of voice is except it's associated with being everywhere, knowing everything, and seeing everything, right? Um, omnipresence, omniscience, and panopticism. Uh, drawing on classic film, Chion describes the acousmetra, 
through scenes from movies such as uh, the movie 2001, the voice of the computer Hal, uh, who is everywhere, knows all, and sees all on the spaceship. Or a classic example would be the Wizard of Oz. Right? So in a key scene near the end of the Wizard of Oz, uh, we see what I think is a definitive example of the deflating moment in which a body of an Akuzmetra is revealed, uh, that which was heretofore mysterious. Uh, and that is what Xion calls, uh, it's somewhat of a cumbersome word, de acousmatization right? The process when a powerful voice turns back into an ordinary person. Uh, when Toto pulls down the curtain on the Wizard of Oz, the magic is revealed to be nothing but smoke, mirrors, microphones, and loudspeakers. So neither Lima nor Lyra are absolute akusmetras whose bodies are never seen like the voice of God in many major Western religions. Um, Xiong would categorize them as imperfect or semi akusmetras but both possess voices considered omnipresent, omniscient, and panoptic in certain measures. And both, and this is key, both risk de acousmatization right? That deflating moment. Um, the cosmopolitan desires of the inhabitants of what uh, is an emerging heritage tourism destination can, I would argue, be heard in the sonority of these two voices when taken together. Uh, they serve as a reminder that uh, the appreciation of heritage and folklore is a very modern phenomenon, and there's some uh, real tensions that are, are playing out in Arco Vergi today. So let me start with Lima. So Lima Fejeda's voice resounds through the city, delivering these death notice announcements, as well as advertisements and political campaign messages. And his soundtrack imposes a message on the listener as it moves past. But in addition to his sound truck work, Lima also performs radio spots that are broadcast live from the store that he is plugging. So he walks through the city, calling in via telephone to the radio station, improvised patter uh, regarding the specials that are featured in a given store on a given day. Uh, and between these two means of projection, uh, the sound truck, announcements and the radio pieces that are delivered through telephone, his booming voice is ubiquitous in the city. So by traver traversing the city of Arco Vergi on foot and in his speaker truck, Lima asserts his close firsthand knowledge of the city. He has a finger on the commercial and community pulse, knowing both who has which messages to communicate and where the appropriate people are located in order to receive each message, right? Lima cites two markedly contrasting voices from 1950s popular culture as reference points for his, for his professional voice. Nat King Cole and the voice of God from the Charlton Heston uh, movie, The Ten Commandments. Um, the first time that he heard the voice of God as a teenager was pivotal for him. As Moses beholds the burning bush, God's voice exudes authority pitched in a register below most speaking voices, evoking a being that is larger than human. Uh, and this clip is actually fairly low. I don't know if there's a way to boost the volume, but hopefully you'll be able to hear it. Lord, Lord, why do you not hear the cries of their children in the bondage of Egypt? Okay, the next ones will be louder, so. And here's Nat King Cole. I'd like to sing for you a very wonderful oldie entitled Unforgettable. <laughs> That's 
what you are. Unforgettable. Though near our far. So Lima began working at radio stations when he was 15, and his golden throat and social and bodily grace have provided him with the means of his social ascension. Lima, with uh, a darker complexion and features perceived as more indigenous than most of the city's elite, has consciously modeled himself after Nat King Cole's habitus of the gentle, effortless crooner. Uh, and here are some examples of the advertisements to give you more of a sense of Lima's voice. Ah, lo, o associado do Esporte Clube tem festa do mais querido. And and notice he mentioned o clima. Uh, so he has a catchphrase, o clima do Lima. No matter what he's advertising, that somehow is enters. So he's advertising himself as much as he's advertising the product. Uh, the so the Pernambucan sertão, uh, or at least this part of it, is ranching territory where many speak with a very distinctive accent. Um, but Lima's pronunciation adheres to a relatively regionally unmarked broadcasting standard. And when he does include a regionalism, he often does it with a slight hesitation that almost serves as air quotes. Lima is Arco Vergi's voice of death and commerce. Lira, in contrast, projects his voice into the pu public sphere uh, through digital recordings and through microphones on festival stages in Arco Vergi and throughout Brazil and uh, and the rest of the world. He's toured Europe and other places. Uh, the grain of Lyra's voice bears the mark of two formative experiences for him. One, state-sponsored cowboy poetry re recitation contests and training in theater. And even before he was a teenager, he would travel to recite poetry that he had learned from the cowhands on his father's ranch. Later, he acted in several plays, honing the projection of his voice and portraying different characters. With his former band, uh, Cordel do Fogo Encantado, Lyra channeled the figures as so associated with the northeastern backlands of the maverick Catholic preacher and the bandit, appearing almost possessed, accompanied by ecstatic candomblé drumming. In his performance with Cordel, he had, like I mentioned, he adopted the apocalyptic, prophetic, millenarian mood, uh, much like the avant-garde film Deus e o Diabo na Terra do Sol, which depicts the region in what can be described as a kind of bleak Brechtian Western. So when Lima aspired to the uh, standard diction of a TV Globo announcer with a sprinkling of regional pronunciation and vocabulary, Lyra, in contrast, used heightened, theatrical, poetic, regionalist speech as a mark of distinctiveness. In his voicing of the words of popular and canonical poets, archaic terms and local cowboy lingo coexists with an incantatory tone. Lyra merges the everyday backlands with the mythic, literary, and cinematic representations of the region. And one of Lyra's most emblematic vocal performances begins with an incantation. The rising pitch, strain, and intensity of his voice combines with the lyrics about inclement weather, giving the feeling of climbing a mountain while weathering a storm to deliver a message. Using his theater training, Lyra projects far from the microphone when he performs this song live, even stepping away from the microphone at points 
and shouting to both his flock of followers and to the heavens. So purposefully straining his voice to its limits, he fits Laurie Strauss's observation that vocal damage, or at least the simulation thereof, quote, has acquired the status of a culturally inscribed desirable mutilation, at least partially analogous to tattooing, end quote. So after a decade of performing, Lyra had become weary of the burden of representing the Northeast region's mythology within Brazilian popular culture, even though he, in his words, ransacked tradition, right? Sacchio uh, afeira, treating it irreverently. As he gathered his critical thoughts regarding the tangle of poetry, prophecy, music, and commerce within which he found himself, Lyra turned to Lima's voice as emblematic of the commercial sphere. So Lyra wrote and acted in a really interesting one-man show titled Mercadoria Si Futuro uh, that played here in Sao Paulo a few times. I don't know if anyone was able to see it about five years ago. Uh, and in this one-man show, he exposes the labor of his particular band, brand of show business by dismantling his past work to detail how it entails a kind of salesmanship, just like Lima. In a way, this live show featuring Lyra in the flesh can be thought of as an attempt to de acousmatize himself, revealing the person behind the curtain that had been rendered larger than life by smoke, mirrors, microphones, and loudspeakers. Playing the character of Lirovsky, who is a salesman and a smooth self-promoter, Lyra breaks down the elements of his sales pitch, and has, as he does that, he triggers with a pedal samples of Lima's voiceovers. So uh, I'm going to show you a 30 minute, a 30 second, rather, it's the 30 second clip of, uh, that's like the trailer for this one man show. And in it, uh, you'll be able to hear uh, Lyra triggering Lima's voice in the context of kind of exposing the labor of his own salesmanship. Mercadorias e futuro Rádio Mercadorias e futuro A voz da Interlândia Mercadorias e futuro com Lira Alpice Mercadorias e futuro so with the, this power to invoke Lima's deep disembodied voice with the stomp of his foot, Lyra brings together the commercial and the poetic that are so often understood as separate and incompatible. Lyra finds the salesmanship in his performance of poetry and prophecy as popular culture. At the same time, he implies that there is poetry and prophecy in Lima's salesmanship. The two aren't as uh, opposite as they are often received. So Lima and Lyra voice the commercial and the literary, the everyday and the legendary within their community and beyond. And in doing so, both try on and take off the power and mystery of the Akuzmetra. In their everyday oral presence, they serve as a kind of voiceover for the city's aspirations and anxieties. As Arcovergi turns into a heritage tourist destination, these often heard and little seen voices are received with pride, longing, and embarrassment. Imagining Arcovergi as a hometown small enough that it can be mapped and memorized is giving way to the perception that the city is becoming 
or the fear is that it's becoming a more overwhelming, anonymous, and forgetful urban center. Concerns about the waning of orality and memory surface right at the moment that figures like Lyra are giving oral tradition a second life as staged heritage. So Lyra's expansive historical memory and feats of poetic memorization assuage fears of culture loss. His mythic vision of Arco Vergi fueled interest in the city throughout Brazil. To portray his Arco Vergi, Lyra stitched together past cinematic literary and folkloric representations of the region and combined them with aggressive popular culture like metal and punk. This vision resonated deeply with intellectuals and college students throughout Brazil, but often alienated local residents who asked, why rehash the past we are trying so hard to leave behind? Why portray regionalist tropes that we feel were being imposed upon us? To many local re residents, Lyra's apocalyptic Arco Vergi was out of phase with their perceptions, which were much more in line with Lima's Arco Vergi. So Lima, in contrast, voices the city as a modern and booming commercial hub that is free of the supposed backwardness of its cowboy past. His ubiquitous voice is relatively jargon-free. It, it's re relatively region-free with broadcaster's diction, and it reigns in a city that serves as the backdrop for Wild West-like backlands on film and TV. The practice of the soundtrack death notice is also vulnerable to being thought of as out of phase or at least out of time. Announcing deaths this way only works in a place where social relationships are mappable to the point where Lima can receive a notice and know which routes to drive to reach the deceased's friends and family. In the relative an anonymity of a larger city, this sort of public address would almost certainly fall short if not seem absurd. So what interests me here in this shift as the city grows is that it's being indexed in the very sonorities of these voices. When taken together, Lima's voice of God baritone and smooth crooner's disposition and Lyra's strained and ragged voicing of a region offer conflicting but coexisting cartographies of Arco Vergi today. Thank you. We have just a few minutes for questions, right? Yeah. Anyone? Okay, I guess there's no questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Dan, for a fascinating talk. Um, I just wondered whether you might be at all interested in, um, because these are sonic phenomena, um, I wondered whether you would be interested in pursuing ways of articulating these ideas that you've been exploring in sound rather than in um, writing or in text or by speaking. In would, uh, that, would that be even, does that make sense? Would that be even right? To sure, your, yeah. To your research by, yeah, I don't know quite how, but you know, uh, by making recordings of these and presenting that as you know, rather than clips being the kind of um, would that be of interest, right? Yeah, no, definitely. I have been uh speaking with uh, a friend who's a filmmaker, uh, and and kind of pitching different ideas in terms of uh working specifically with her. Um, and she's actually most interested in, there's a third voice in this story, in the actual uh, article in the proceedings. Uh, I didn't have time to talk about it, but uh, João da Informação is uh, a quadriplegic who is only known or principally known in Arco Vergi through his voice because people call him and he memorized, uh, purportedly memorized all the phone numbers in the city. And uh, and so it's a kind of homegrown, community-based directory assistance, where he says a 10-second ad, 
and uh, and then answers people's questions about the city. Um, and uh, and I really wanted to do uh, a short film on him, um, but because he's bedridden, he's been reluctant to do that. So I've respected that. Um, I do have a website about Arcovergi that has a lot of the audio and video clips that I talk about in my book. Um, so this is a post book project. The book is about music. Uh, it's about Lyra in a more musical context. Um, so I have played with uh, supplementary materials, but uh, but haven't gone as far as you have. Uh, I would love to talk to you uh, further about uh, it's it's interesting territory. Yeah. Thank a lot for your talk. Super interesting. Uh, I was curious about why putting Lira uh, in the same space of thought as Lima, because uh, Lira is, uh, we know him as right. a performatic artist, not only as a voice, of course, right. but in as you show him uh, as a theater, uh, theater man, uh, performative artist. And it, uh, it's uh, interesting in Grassan, <laughs> right. to, to put him in the same place as Lima. Right. Um, I, I really, I, I think it was very interesting, but if you could talk a little more about this choice of thinking of him as a voice, not as a body with a voice and everything. Right, it, yeah, it might make a little more sense in the context of, uh, so I, I spent 11 years working on um, this book project, which was uh, really about the entanglement of traditional and experimental music in Arco Vergi, and particularly the uh, rich and complicated relationship between uh, uh, Samaji Koku performers that were marked as culture bearers and and Lira and, and Cordel do Fogo Encantado. Uh, and so when he did his one man show where he was looking back and thinking about his past work and, and starting to move forward with his solo career, it really struck me that he used Lima. It was really triggered from that, 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 that moment. Um, and, and I think of it as a kind of supplement to my other work where I really acknowledge him as a performer. Um, uh, but I do think that, there's something really interesting about the fact that the voice that is most heard within Arco Vergi, that is emblematic of Arco Vergi, is, is Lima, not Lyra. And that the voice that is most synonymous with Arco Vergi outside of Arco Vergi is Lyra, arguably. And that the one that is outside is much more re regionally distinctive, and the one that's inside is uh, trying to claim a kind of universality. That tension struck me as worth pursuing, but I understand, yeah, yeah. Um, that is the book out. Yes. Great. Yeah. That sounds fantastic. Um, I just wanted to follow the sort of pattern of questions. It's a brief one, but I hope of interest to others than the anthropologist. But tell us your question to uh, to Dan and your own paper earlier, and then Rosa, your question and your presentation earlier. You know, threw up for me the the whole question of ethnographic you know practice and knowledge now and you know i i come from a generation older than certainly uh, rosa and tullis and older than you too but what you know my bias i'm going to call it a bias but of course i'm actually voicing an opinion is that the kind of nuanced analysis you gave of the imbrication of these figures their music and their the renown their circuits and so on in the city and the significance and then the regional reading you know it, it's something that to us i would say is probably quite difficult to translate into the kind of work that you talked about and i'm just struck by you know these different forms of knowledge now uh, and they have different powers and prowess but yeah i mean i just wanted to say we have definitely a kind of 
what do we have a generational transition or a standoff between two forms of ethnographic knowledge but anyway it, it it's really interesting i don't know if you just sort of agree with me that there are you know both are very productive but they also have different kinds of of purchase you know um, right that makes sense that each each form uh has its its strengths and and drawbacks i when i when I write, I always think of the kinds of decisions that I think I come back to film as my main other medium that, that I think about, but the same kinds of decisions that documentary filmmakers make. Um, the, the narrative writing, ethnographic writing style is very important to me. And so thinking about moments of zooming in and, and then also, I, I mean, I do think that the, the supplementary, uh, website is is important but but uh, uh like uh georgina mentioned um i am uh concerned about losing the nuance as well uh, that or i'm just used to certain mediums and so i'm kind of uh, starting to branch out but but don't want to lose the the kind of detail that you can do uh in in a written context but that's a great question thank you Okay, I should, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm the no, chair as sorry. well, so I need to sorry. stop myself. <laughs> sorry. Right. I feel like I should be selling you a blender with this. <laughs> Hello.